In December 1972, Eugene Cernan and Jack Smith in Apollo 17 made the last trip to the moon so far. When they came down, I went to America and talked to Gene Cernan about it. Well, Chris Linthal has been back to America to talk to him now and see how he feels about it 35 years later. It was a passion that started when I was a young boy during World War II with a desire to fly airplanes that ended, ended up with me being able to look home, standing in a valley on the moon and realizing the fact that I'm alive, it's not a dream, I am really there on the moon. A miracle. The Johnson Space Center in Houston is home to NASA's manned missions. Here, astronauts train to fly the space shuttle and to work on the International Space Station. It was also home to the Apollo missions, as NASA attempted what's been called the greatest adventure, putting a man on the moon. Using 1960s technology, the astronauts flew with less computer power than my mobile phone. Their success still stands as one of mankind's greatest achievements. It's difficult to imagine just how big the Saturn V rocket that took men to the moon actually is until you're standing next to it and then it's really impressive. It's not just the rocket though, the Apollo program at its height employed more than 400,000 people. All of that effort just to put three men in there and send them to the moon. This effort was inspired by President Kennedy's nearly impossible challenge, issued in May 1961. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Just three weeks before that speech, Alan Shepard had become the first American in space. His flight, just 15 minutes long, didn't take him into orbit, but reached a height of 160 miles. The moon seemed out of reach, a quarter of a million miles further away. This was mission control for each of the Apollo missions. You can still feel the tension in the air and actually smell the cigarette smoke. Forty years ago, mission control rang to the voices of astronauts, engineers and scientists, all working together to guide their colleagues. Gene Cernan often served as Capcom, the only person allowed to talk directly to the crew up in space. It's a quieter place today, but there are still reminders of Cernan's three trips into space. Gemini 9, which featured his epic spacewalk. Apollo 10, when he flew closer to the moon than any man before him. And Apollo 17, the last mission to land on the moon. Ooh, and here we are. Mission control. Wow. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of history here. Mm -hmm. Gemini 9. So where would you have sat? Which was your desk? Well, when I was capsule communicator, I would sit right up here, but it, we were... A lot of times, when you were a prime crew or backup crew, you'd just, you'd just be here at watching. These were different kind of ECS panels, environmental control panels, launch panels. Where in those events, you'd probably be with the engineers who were running at the console. Well, first of all, I've got to tell you, it's a little nostalgic to, to be in this room and see my, my, my picture there, my face or my body walking on a moon some... 35 years ago, I haven't been in here for a long time, but a lot of very historical and exciting things happened here from Apollo 8, Apollo 11, Apollo 13. Uh, of course, I think Apollo 10 and Apollo 17 were pretty exciting. Born in 1934, Navy pilot Eugene Cernan was just 29 when he was recruited to join the Gemini program. Before they could go to the moon, they first had to develop, from scratch, the techniques required for rendezvous and docking and for spacewalks. With the pressure of Kennedy's deadline, training to be an astronaut was an intense experience. You're the new kid on the block. You're the, you're the freshman with a senior class of the original seven, several of them who wanted to fly again. Now you've got a group of, of nine just selected one year ahead of you, very capable, some of the finest uh, test pilots, uh, uh, in a world were standing in front of you in line to fly the first mission they'd get their hands on. 
And to get there, you had to fly in space first. And you, the first mission was Gemini uh, 9. Um, what was the purpose of Gemini? What was the stated aim for Gemini 9? We needed to find out what the problems that we would encounter uh, were going to be. You know, you got more computing power in the palm of your hand today than we had to go to the moon. So I'm even taking you prior to going to the moon. In Gemini, we had barrel drum like the old slot machine, a barrel drum computer with limited memory. And so, you know, we did a lot of manual computations. And that was always a backup. So we had to prove whether we could use uh, some rendezvous radar with a very limited capability computer and or do it on paper and figure out where the other spaceship was to rendezvous and what our closing rates were. So we did, and we had to do it at night. We had to do it in the daytime. We did all that. Gemini 9 had two main tasks. The first was to practice docking techniques, formation flying with a malfunctioning unmanned vehicle which became known as the Angry Alligator. The other major goal was uh, a spacewalk. Ed White on Gemini 4 was the first American to walk in space. He was out for some 20 minutes. It was a wonderful experience. We've got wonderful film. So here on Gemini 9, with a grand total of 20 minutes of experience prior to our flight, it was a plan that I would go out for almost three hours, uh, do some umbilical dynamics, which means just hang on the end of an umbilical in zero gravity for 15 to 30 minutes, then crawl back to the back of the spacecraft in a very stiff, hard suit. In those days, the suits were just... When, when they pressurized, you were like a balloon at a, at a, a parade down Broadway on, on Thanksgiving Day. Umbilical dynamics proved one thing very, very quickly, that we cannot operate in space without some kind of stabilizing system. Because being on the end of the umbilical is like a rubber band. And you just float out in space and you tumble and you get to the end of the umbilical or rubber band and it bounces you back, but not necessarily straight back. It might bounce you over there and turn you this way. And, it, it, it was very obvious that we could not operate. We had to have some stabilization system of some kind. And then went back to the uh, back of the spacecraft and we had neglected to respect in our planning uh, Mr. Newton's laws of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So I'm back there in zero gravity with a couple handlebars to hold on to and of all things, and of all things, a foot rail to, to, to put my feet on top of. But there's no gravity to keep your feet on top of. I didn't have any of those golden slippers which eventually allowed us to do the things we can do in space today. So I had to literally put one foot on top of that rail and another foot underneath it to hold myself there. One arm here, twist a valve, it would twist me back. and I. I'd be flailing and out there and work my way back. It forced me to work far harder than anyone anticipated. I overpowered the environmental control system. The suit, my heart rate was 160, 170. Eventually, the humidity in my suit became uh, so high, I just literally fogged my visor over. Uh, at nighttime, I had two little, two little pin lights, like little small flashlights. One didn't work. I couldn't see. My visor was frosted, fogged over. I was truly exhausted. I didn't like it, but we made a decision that we probably had gone just far enough without taking me over the edge. Came home and I kept thinking Gemini 9 was a failure. But indeed it wasn't. We probably learned more from Gemini 9. We, as a result, we developed this liquid cool garment under our suits for Apollo that we uh, could stay cool with running cold water through uh, our suits and that was significant important on the moon because we could work hard there too. Uh, of course we learned a lot about rendezvous as far as training for for spacewalks and EVA we developed the underwater training which is not really zero G but neutral buoyancy gives you a feeling for what you might encounter in zero gravity. Gemini is sort of the forgotten space program but a necessary ingredient to go from Mercury to Apollo. And without Gemini, we never would have been 
able to take the kind of bold steps we took in those days during Apollo. One of those bold steps was the development of the Saturn V rocket. To carry the larger Apollo spacecraft, it had to be nearly four times the size of the rockets that carried Gemini. And it was the Saturn V that took Cernan on his next spaceflight, Apollo 10. It was to be a dress rehearsal for the first landing on the moon. The command module, known as Charlie Brown, would be detached from Snoopy, the lunar module. Cerna would then pilot Snoopy to just nine miles above the moon's surface. Okay, that's the three of us, and here's the other two on Apollo 10. Your friendly Charlie Brown and our ever-loving companion Snoopy. Throughout these difficult manoeuvres, being tested for the first time, it was mission control that guided the astronauts through the vast, empty void of space. It just always amazed me when we leave the Earth, someone in this room is looking at charts and maps and saying, you're at the right speed, you're at the right attitude, you're right on a trajectory to miss the moon by 50 miles. That's very comforting thought, by the way. You go to the moon and you're in daylight the whole time. And all of a sudden, you go into this shadow of the moon. You go into darkness. Okay, we're coming into the Terminator, Houston. You can't see it, but you can feel its presence. You, you, know, you know this big hunk is out there somewhere, not very far away. And then you, you creep around behind the moon, and then all of a sudden the sun comes up. Your first lunar sunrise, and it comes up very bright, very rapidly. There's no atmosphere, no color. It's just all of a sudden, boom, bright sunlight. And you look down there, close enough to touch, 50 miles away. Ominous in a way, hostile to a degree, but not unfriendly. Because when you come around and all of a sudden there's the Earth, and now you're in radio contact with the Earth, and now you're on the front side. The separation of the lunar module went as planned and Cernan and Commander Tom Stafford dropped down to coast above the lunar surface. Joe, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that might be Gutenberg right there. I'm looking, uh, showing you the central peak, uh, which is very clear on my monitor here. Roger, that, that's where all the pencils are pointing down here, Geno. But near disaster followed their smooth descent. A mix-up between the astronauts almost sent the lunar module crashing into the surface. Tumbling in space, they flicked the correct switch with only seconds to spare. Apollo 10 was a huge success. All Apollo 11 needed to do to land on the moon was follow in their footsteps. We did everything on Apollo 10 except land. I tell Neil we painted that white line in the sky so we wouldn't get lost and all he had to do was cover that last 47,000 feet. Back from Apollo 10, and I'm backup commander of Apollo 14, and from Apollo 14, I'm commander of Apollo 17. T-minus one minute and counting, now in the final minute of the With the moon landing achieved, NASA's budget was cut, and so too were the Apollo missions. Cernan was commander of the last manned mission to the moon, Apollo 17, which saw the only night launch of a Saturn V. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff, and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. The mission's target? The mountainous highlands of the Serenitatis Basin and a place called Taurus Littrow. Whereas Apollo 11 landed in pretty much of a flat desert area, notwithstanding the boulders that Neil encountered. We landed in a mountainous valley that was surrounded by mountains on three sides. Higher than the Grand Canyon of Arizona is deep, so five miles wide, 20 miles long. So when we came down, we were truly down among them. When we pitched over so I could see the landing site and fly to my desired landing point, we were already below the tops of the mountains. Probably the most challenging landing site of all the Apollo missions. Contact. Okay, Houston, the Challenger has landed. You know, when the lunar lander came down, it was like a, the old Beverly Hillbillies pickup truck with pianos strapped to the side and everything. We had lunar rover packed to one side. We had a small nuclear power plant to the other side. We had geology, exploration equipment, experiments packed to the other side. If someone could have been taking a picture of us landing, that would have been the, the picture 
of the, of the century because there we were. Unfortunately, there was no one there. Fortunately, there was no one there to take that picture. But we had to unload all that equipment, uh, get the lunar rover, unpack the lunar rover, get it operating. Hello. Put all our equipment on it. We had several experiments to put out, experiments that were running as long as 10 years later. So for the next three days, we were truly lunar explorers. There's a lot of dust about. Was that much of a problem? The surface is covered with dust. It's like graphite. It's a gray-like material. It penetrates everything. And in some cases, it's two or three meters deep. Other places, it's just a film on top of the outcropping rocks. But it covers everything. It's what makes the mountains, the big massifs that surrounded us, look somewhat smooth. But if you could blow away the lunar dust, It'll probably be very rugged outcrops. Ah, uh, thank you, Dino. It looks much better. And you even had to do repairs. Uh, I was the only automobile within a quarter of a million miles, and I knocked a fender off, and I kept wondering, where was that roadside assistance when, <laughs> when I really needed it? That 24-hour roadside assistance uh, wasn't there. You want to hold it there? Yeah, you're going to have to, I reckon. There we go. So we did fabricate a, a fender out of some lunar geology maps. And indeed, duct tape does work on the moon. Now, <laughs> why do we need to do that? Because the dust would, would roost the tail over the top and come over all our electronic equipment, which was cooled by radiation cooling, and we got on our face mask, be all over us. And it, the dust, I cannot tell you, was one of the most inhibiting factors of our stay on the moon. And it, it worked. It brought that fender back, and I think it's in the Smithsonian right now. How far did you get from the lunar module? Well, we covered about 36 kilometers in the three days we were on the surface of the moon. I'm not sure exactly how far we got on any given time, probably 10 kilometers away. I, I can tell you that the lunar module, if it, if it wasn't out of sight, was just a, a speck in the sand out there across the valley. We would always go furthest point first because if the lunar rover broke down, we wanted to have enough oxygen to walk back so that we'd always go to the furthest place and then work our way around and always coming closer and closer. One of the other unique things about Apollo 17, it was the first flight of a scientist. Jack Schmidt was a lunar geologist. He was not a pilot, he was not a test pilot, he was not an aviator, although he, he did uh, go through flight training. Two, three, four millimeter size uh, fragments of glass were kicking up all over the place. If, you, if you're careful coming over here, we can get glass. It looks like it may have crystallized in place there. And the famous example of needing a human to be there is the discovery of the orange soil. Hey, there is orange soil. Well, don't move it till I see it. I was convinced he'd been sucking too much oxygen. <laughs> he'd, he'd been on the surface too long. There's not supposed to be orange soil on the surface moon, but indeed it was. Hey, it is. I can see it from here. It's orange. Wait, let me put my visor up. It's still orange. Sure it is. Crazy. And yet, those three days you spent there, you exist as normal. You have to sleep, you eat, you work. You're still a human being. The two things you uh, supposedly need to survive in this world of ours are sleep and water. And, and how do you sleep on the moon? Uh, I've been asked that question many times. Well, not very well. You, but you do sort of back off and relax. Uh, and I kept thinking that first night we, we had to pull the shades and make it dark and sign a little marshal. I had to look back out and there was our flag, there were the mountains, there was the earth. We could always see it right out the front window. And why am I sleeping on the moon? I've come all this way and worked off this hard. What a waste of time. Just let me stay up for three days. Let me, get, let me absorb as much of it as I possibly can while I'm here. In retrospect, when you lay back on those little hammocks we had, something you can do in one six gravity, you can't do in zero gravity, which is really very comfortable. In retrospect, that did give you a chance to think about where you were. And that really was a significant part of your stay on the moon, as much as being out there driving a rover or collecting rocks. But right now, I'm back there. I'm driving on the moon as I'm talking to you. I know what it looks like. I, I know where my daughter's initials are. Uh, I know where the flag is. I know what the lunar module looks like when it's just a speck in a desert out there from way, way far away. But you can't go 
around with a sign around your neck saying, hey, world, I went to the moon. You know, you owe me something. It, it, it was a privilege. It was, a, it, it, was, it was one of those things, you know, twice to the moon, lived on the moon. I don't, I don't take that for granted. But here I am today, three and a half decades later, I got nine grandkids. I'm still flying my own airplane. I'm still flying Learjets around the world. Uh, I've, I've got, there's more to live for than to live in the past. I can't live in the past. I hope my grandkids someday appreciate what Poppy did. But I've got to live for what's going to happen tomorrow, next year, and the year after that. The only thing that I'm realistic about is I'd, I'd like to be around when that next human being takes the next step on the moon, takes that, that, that burden of history off my shoulders, if you will. And it will happen. It's been, uh, it's got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you. Uh, Roger 17, and uh, we thank you very much. Now we're going back to the moon. What can we learn from Apollo? We don't want to reinvent the wheel going back to the moon. Live and learn from what we've done right, correct what we did wrong, make it safer, make it more compatible to live there, and let's get on with space exploration. I'm a little disappointed with what's gone on for the last 30 years. You know, um, we don't have the capability to go back to the moon today. We're trying to redevelop it all over again. Nine, eight, seven, six, go for main engine start. Was it a mistake to do the shuttle program after Apollo? Should we have pressed on back to the moon and Mars? Well, you can go back to decisions that were made even during Apollo 17 time to develop the shuttle. Uh, a cost-effective reusable vehicle, well, it's reusable, but it's never truly been cost-effective. On the other hand, it's, it's, it's one of the most sophisticated flying machines we've ever des designed, built, and flown. It's a phenomenal machine, and it does wonderful things within two or three hundred miles of, this, of the Earth. But from my point of view, it doesn't go anywhere. You know, when you've been to the moon, not once but twice, staying home, you know, this sounds a little arrogant, staying home is no longer good enough. We've been there, done that. Let's get on with it. As he prepared to say goodbye to the moon, Cernan knew he was also signing off for the whole Apollo program. His words would go down in history alongside Neil Armstrong's one small step just over three years earlier. When it came time to leave, everybody, uh, you know, was anxious to know what I was going to say when I left, the last words would be said on the moon, and I really wasn't sure. I didn't want to leave, yet I knew we had to, and I looked down at my final footsteps. And they were important to me because I knew that I personally was not going to come this way again. And I don't know how long I was on that ladder, but I kept thinking, you know, I, I've been on a plateau somewhere out in space, on another body in our universe. Uh, science and technology had, had got me to that plateau. And when I look back at the Earth from a quarter of a million miles away, science and technology didn't have the answers for what I was thinking, what I was seeing, and perhaps more important, what I was feeling. You're standing in sunlight surrounded by the blackest black you can conceive in your mind the endlessness of space, the infinity, the endlessness of time. And they're out three-dimensionally out there in that blackness is the earth, the multicolored blues of the oceans um, and, and the whites of the clouds. It's almost if your arm were long enough, you could reach out into that endlessness and bring the earth back to you, hold it in the palm of your hand. This is Gene, and I'm on the surface.
And when I look back at the earth from a quarter of a million miles away, the beauty, the perfectness, the logic of the earth for the last three days, for the last trillions of years. And if I could have had every human being in the world standing next to me at that moment, I truly believe the world would be a different place to live in today. 99, proceeded, three, two, one, ignition. Right that way, Houston. That's your good. Ag five. But it seems only yesterday, I talked to Gene Sun, I mean, he's just come back from the moon. Now, 35 years later, we have even more news, and I wonder when we're going to go back there. I'm sure we will, just when, I don't know. Well, Chris, you're back from America, welcome, and um, we have two more interesting lunar probes, one Japanese and one Chinese. The Japanese probe Kaguya, an orbiter, going around the moon now, and sending back remarkably good pictures. Yes, aren't they stunning? This one in particular, it's wonderful to watch Earth yeah. rise over the moon. And indeed, it's seen Earth set as well. But this is an interesting area for exploration. Yes. Because some of these craters are deep enough that they never see the sun at all, at least not at the bottom. Whereas some of their peaks remain almost entirely in the sunlight. And that makes this an ideal place for a future lunar base. Also, of course, a Chinese probe, Chang'e 1. That also is an orbiter, and it's got there. Yes, it's got there and it's a success. And it's very much the first step in what should be an expanded Chinese yes, program. Indeed. And something else too, um, this comet, Comet Holmes, a most remarkable thing, looks rather like a globular cluster and it's now actually larger than the sun. Yes, this is the misbehaving comet. It is. What's unusual is that it's on its way out. It was at its closest to the sun much earlier in the year and it had this enormous outburst which led to it being 400,000 times brighter than it should have been. It's still visible with the naked eye, although it's faded slightly. Yes, indeed. Um, and as you say, there seems to be the shell of material which has been ejected from the comet. I don't think it's an impact. It's done this before. Yes, what's interesting is that apart from its brightening, there are signs of a tail, Indeed. particularly in some of the amateur images, but the Hubble Space Telescope images of the comet are fairly dull. They just show this expanding shell of material. And you know, I think we might never know quite what happened to this comet. I wonder, it's unlike anything I've seen before, it's still with us. Absolutely. You can find it easily enough. Uh, it's visible with the naked eye. The other star, Epsilon Persei, and in particular, it looks rather like a globular cluster. Yes, I've been keeping an eye on it each evening. It's easily visible, even from a, a reasonably light location. You don't have to be in a dark sky to see this. So go and have a look. Chris, thank you very much. Well, when we come back next month, we're going to talk about cosmic debris. And there's plenty to say about that. And of course, before that, well, I think it's not too early to wish you all a very happy Christmas. And so, until 2008, good night. And the Sky at Night is back on BBC Four Sunday at nine.